everybody. Why don't we just kind of start from the top? How did you get involved with the stay at home daughter movement? Well, so um, my family was a little different than some of them um, because they uh, were not like super hardcore into like, oh, girls need to stay at home all the time. Um, so we kind of, but all our friends were. So, you know, parents, they tend to be, well, this must be the right thing, you know? So we kind of went through this transition of, um, I'm preparing to always dreaming of going to college and those kind of things to no, it's not a good idea. And it's, you can't go. Okay. Um, and so, and I think, um, that was really hard for me because I was a very education driven person. I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to, I wanted to be a missionary and go to nursing school. Um, so it was hard for me to wrap my head around. Um, this is the only right way to be, you know, be at home and be, uh, um, when I went we went to um, Bill Gothard's seminars, you know, the life seminars. And uh, I kept asking a lot of questions because I'm like, I just don't see this in the Bible. Like the, you have to listen to your parents and everything. And even after you get married, if they tell you not to go to a certain church, you shouldn't go. <laughs> and, sure. Wow. And, uh, you know, and most of our friends were that way so it was hard because I was kind of labeled as uh, maybe more rebellious because I didn't just accept it but it definitely impacted my life because then when I so when I was I was working um at the library um from 16 to 18 Okay. And, um, but our, so a friend, so they had come and they were like, you shouldn't be working outside the home, you know, mm -hmm. even though my parents had wanted me to, because they needed me to pay my car insurance. Um, and so I had to go in and tell them that I was quitting mm -hmm. and, um, and we were going to supposedly have like a family business and I was supposed to work with the family and do, do those kind of things. Um, I was really pressured to be thinking about getting married. At, at 18. Yeah. Well, sure. this was even before that 17, it was like, you, you should be thinking about who you can marry. And we lived in Libby. So sure. there wasn't a lot of people. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Not a lot of <laughs> options to choose. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm thinking, yeah, no, this is not going to work. Well, um, my, um, ex-husband's brother, he lived with us at that point and he lived with us for about nine months. Um, and even though his family had gone back to Minnesota, he was still with us. And so his brother had come to visit a couple times and um it was kind of it's a very weird story but it was basically a step above an arranged marriage okay so not a so I didn't know him I had met him two months before before he got married yeah or four months before and then we were engaged for two months before we got married and is this a long distance relationship for those two? Yeah, months? He, he was in Minnesota. Okay. Um, he lived in Minnesota. He came out to visit once. And then about four weeks before we got married, he came out. Yes. Okay. So um, okay. I don't want to jump too far ahead. Um, yeah. But walk me through your, because, you know, it seems like everyone I interview in this movement has a different courtship dating 
yeah. um, experience. And that oftentimes is tied into the ideology of the stay at home daughter movement. Like it kind of yeah. feels like it goes hand in hand. Mm-hmm. What was this time like? I mean, did you guys go on dates? Did you have phone calls with each other or was it very much like you are just, your parents picked him out. He's good. You know, you're going yeah, for actually it. my parents didn't really pick him out as much as his brother did. And then my parents, they were like, okay, we'll go around, along with it. Um, but so, you know, you're involved in the, there's, there was this huge push at that point in the nineties to, you know, courtship, stay at home daughters, the, you know, the good parents, they do this stuff. They, you take care of and kind of dictate your children's lives. There's the, you know, there was Bill Gothard and we were not quite, we didn't fit quite into all their boxes to do like ATI. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did a lot of it though with my friends, their parents. Um, So, and we, so I think as far as like courtship, we didn't really even have a courting time period because we never went we were never alone together ever um we one time I think we sat on the stairs alone together and my mom got my mom said that she thought that would be a good idea so that maybe we could talk and she got in trouble oh your mom got in trouble with yeah now, when you say yeah. your mom got in trouble, is she getting in yeah. trouble with her church or like her friends? I mean, technically who... our church. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. it was, um, we had kind of, a, it was like a home church, but it was very, we had like a lot of rules, very detailed sure. rules that we had to follow and agree to. Um, so she, you know, got lectured and told you never, ever do that again. You know, basically it was akin to, you know, uh, on the road to adultery or, you know. Sure. Sure. So for someone that maybe has not like experienced Mm -hmm. this or or grown up in the same circles as you, um, can you just define, like define the stay at home daughter movement, you know, in a nutshell to somebody that's never heard of it before yeah so for for in my experience it was um the parents said you know that basically women were more at risk if they were going out into the world and doing um putting coming out from underneath the umbrella of their parents and especially their father um and that the mother and the daughters especially needed to stay underneath the authority of of their father if they went out and got a job or went to school or whatever they would be underneath someone else's authority and that would cause problems so when you have that pressure though from all these outside people who look really good they've got amazing families they're having these uh, well, you know, our daughters, you know, they waited till their, their dad found them this amazing mate. Now they're happy. They have court, you know, good courtship stories, all these different things. Um, you start to want it, you know, you mm-hmm. think, oh, that looks really good. You get, I got homeschool newsletters, you know, at magazines and, the uh, um, and they would put stories in there about, you know, oh, you know, this is what we're doing. We're, we're teaching piano lessons at home or we're helping with our dad's, you know, business. And so um, the one thing I remember my mom, though, saying that she had a lot of problems with was because her um, dad died when she was 12. Okay. And her mom was widowed. And so they had to, um, she had to take care of, you know, their family. Uh-huh. And she said, you know, you should always have something that you can take care of the family if there was a problem you know like if you lost a spouse and that was not something that was really addressed very well it was more like well you know get life insurance (laughs) okay (laughs) (laughs) you know and so we felt like there was some you know not 
there is some details that were left out and they were like that's a really rare thing that doesn't happen very often you know that sure I have to do it you know or you know you'll just have to find a new person to marry oh okay you know right and hopefully at that point your parents will help you find that again so even a second marriage they're like mm-hmm. we still would be involved and yeah yeah so like one of my very good friends um they were definitely like they didn't really do like you would go to go shopping or anything it was like oh i need to go ask my dad oh wow you know i need to you know and even later i remember um one of them she had a baby when she wasn't married Mm -hmm. and like her dad and her brothers were there when she had her baby wow yeah it was a little odd (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I I can't yeah I can't um, really you no know, but yeah. she was like well you know I don't have a husband and I need them there to be praying for me and to be there you know and that was very different you know yeah. I was kind of like oh okay I don't know about this um so when did you first because you said you were kind of asking questions even at like an ATI yeah. conference when did you start questioning it where you were like uh, I don't know if this makes sense. I was always kind of a questioner. Mm -hmm. I think it was, um, I didn't stop as much until, um, after I got married, um, you just don't, you don't have as much energy for questions. Sure. (laughs) When you, when there's a lot of other problems going on Mm -hmm. in life. And so, um, you know, I kind of stopped saying them out loud because I was tired of you know, getting in trouble basically for it or lectured and right. Um, so our family was because it was so different. We didn't quite fit into all the boxes. Uh It didn't, it didn't, uh, it happened a little later for me where like my younger siblings, they probably, it impacted them more. Um, okay. but almost in a good way, because when my mom saw my sis, my next sister and I, and what happened, she said, I don't think this is right. Okay. So your mom was the one that kind of got yeah the change of heart. And sure. She said, I think it's, you know, it's a good idea to encourage them to get more education, um, right. you know, to kind of experience other things besides just, um, wish for marriage. Mm-hmm. And, and living in your father's house, like she said there, I just don't see it. Sure. Sure. Right. Now, Um, did they have a particular verse or, you know, you you mentioned ATI as being kind of a driving uh force for these ideas, but was there anyone else, you know, besides your church that was propagating it? And then what were they using? Were they using a specific scripture or, you know, something to justify it? Um, I'm trying to remember some of them. I mean, we had a lot of different Bible verses that they would, you know, talk about, but it was kind of, you know, the story of uh, Dinah was always brought up, you know, that she went out to see the land and she came out from underneath her dad's authority and then she got raped. Oh, and so, okay. you know, basically, I mean, I had one friend that told me that her daughter never went to ever went to a store ever without her brother or her dad, because otherwise she'd be raped. Wow. And it perpetuated a lot of fear Mm -hmm. when you're hearing that. Yeah. Um, I remember having, I had a panic attack, um, at one point because, um, our car broke down, our Mm -hmm. van had broken down and there Um, they usually never will pull a car with people in it, but it was way below zero outside and they decided they were going to do it. But some people had to ride in the, with the tow truck. Okay. And so, um, they said, one of the men said, okay, I want you, you and you to go in the tow truck. And I freaked out because you're hearing like, I'm, you don't, you're not alone with a man that you don't know ever. (laughs) (laughs) and you're telling me to ride in the tow truck you know and they were kind of frustrated with me um but 
but in their minds, you know, it was just, it had to be done. And why are you freaking out? Yeah. They have no idea. I'm sure. Yeah. But, but they had been teaching us that for months, for years, you know, you're not alone with a man or else it's basically your fault if something happens. And so I think that was, I mean, when I think about Bible verses, that was a big one. Um, Mm -hmm. Girls, they, you know, they're more at risk. Um, and everything was even before like more the stay-at-home daughter movement everything was in the way you dress the way you talk um you had to think about um are you going to be coming to harm because you dressed the wrong way okay your dress wasn't long enough your hair you spent too much time on your hair you and you're talking about like Mennonite type clothes. Sure, sure. So you oh, were not, not wearing anything no, that would be No, I mean, I'm like yeah. wearing like cotton calico dresses that are down to my ankles, mm-hmm. and, you know, and being told that my dress wasn't long enough and therefore I was responsible for someone's evil thoughts, you know. Was there ever any responsibility put on to the men? Like, were the men ever told, you know, you're responsible for your actions if you do something towards a woman not appropriate? Not generally. I mean, it was kind of like, yeah, that's not good, but, you know, they shouldn't have been doing A through C, Mm -hmm. you know? So it was kind of like, well, yeah, it's not good, but you should, they need to get married. Okay. One, um, I heard that a lot. Like if a guy is, if they're having like tempting thoughts and stuff, oh, they just need to get married so they can have sex. And did that fix it? Oh no. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) probably not. Um, okay. So talk to me a little bit about how this affected your relationship with your mom. Did it cause extra strain? I mean, was there like fighting going on between you two over this or was it, you know, still okay? My mom and I were really close. We're, she was only 17 when she had me. So that far apart in age. Um, and so I think the biggest thing with us is we got really quiet. We didn't talk to each other Mm -hmm. because we were worried about what was, what would happen if we said the wrong thing. And I think that impacted our relationship in that time. Um, because you don't, if you're concerned about, well, everything needs to go through the men, then you were worried about talking between yourselves, even with my mom and I, and we talked about everything. And so it did impact that part of it. Um, when I did, um, start having children, um, you know, it gave us something safe that we could talk about that hopefully they weren't going to be upset about. Okay. But it definitely, the whole, I think what happens is that you have the stay at home daughter movement and it just impacts all these other things that go into other places. Sure. The women being oppressed, um, and being like, you are, you can't think for yourself. You can't talk for yourself. You can't read, the, you know, almost read the Bible for yourself. You need to make sure that you, everything goes through a man. Yeah. It, it caused problems with our other female relationships. Because you feel like you can't be honest with them. Yeah. Or even you're laughing and talking and whatever. And then, um, one of them would say, come and say, oh, I'm really sorry that I was so foolish. Oh, wow. Because you know, foolish, remember the verse about foolish women? Okay. Um, going house to house. It's like in the New Testament. Sure. I don't remember which one. Sure, yeah. Um, and that was a big um, push. Like you have to make sure you're not one of those foolish women. And so if you were happy, that was considered to be well, you must have been being foolish. Okay. And so 
So walk me through, you know, you're, you're 18. You've got this guy that his brother's kind of wanting to marry, you get married. At what point do you realize like, this is not like this movement is not working. Maybe I should get a job. Maybe I should pursue something else. Um, how did you get out of it? Yeah. So I'm, um, I'm 18. I, they didn't, um, so no courting, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Basically his brother came to me and said, Hey, he'd like to marry you. What do you think about that? So no proposal. Oh, so he didn't actually propose to you. No. Okay. His brother kind of basically did. And I said, so, so stop for just a minute. Why do you think his brother was so passionate about getting him married? The whole, like he needs to get married because he has sexual urges. Okay. Is really the key thing. And right. I didn't really know that at that point because I'm, you know, I'm 18. I've lived in a sheltered household that, sure. you know, I didn't grow up with TV or, um, you know, normal things. And, right. um, I was fairly well educated, but you still, you're very sheltered. Mm -hmm. you, know, so you don't realize those kind of things. Um, and so what was your reaction when, when his brother said, you know, do you want to marry him? I was kind of shocked. Sure. I didn't know this guy. He barely spoke English. Yeah. Um, you know, like we had spoken to each other maybe five times in passing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, th and the rule in the church was, is that if somebody asked like to marry you, you weren't allowed to talk to anyone about it. You had to make the decision before you could talk to anyone about it, even your parents. Wow. So they didn't really, you know, I'm just thinking that my dad did know. And so I did, but I wasn't really supposed to talk to him. They had to ask my dad first. And so they okay. had done that. Um, my, so it was, it was not quite exactly like a lot of the ATI type of courtships where the dad, like, you know, chooses with it all, Yeah, but it was similar, you know, okay. kind of a, it was a weird Russian tradition kind of more oh, okay and so they um we were trying to wrap our heads around that too because we're american that have done like okay the courtship thing you know they you talk to the dad and this and they're saying oh no you can't talk to anyone about it and so my answer to him was what happens if i say yes yeah and i felt like the world kind of imploded they all just assumed I said yes. Oh, and um, was there yeah. was this partly the language barrier? Do you think? Um, at that point, maybe. Um, but his family. Next thing I know, I'm engaged, and they're okay. planning a wedding. Does he give you a ring? No, no okay. ring. And still, I never really. I hadn't really talked to him, um, very much. There. And then they said, well, you know, we don't believe in long engagements because it's, it's very um, easy to get tempted. I remember so, hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. So you're going to get married in, you know, a couple months. And, and this is his family that's telling you this. Mm -hmm. What yeah. is your family's reaction at this point? Um, I remember my, they were asking me like, okay, is this something you really want to do? And um, I said, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, and so we were in Minnesota at that point and, um, we started driving home and the motor home that we were in broke down. And so we were, we were stuck there for a little while in Fargo and I, he had called me and he said, my mom is really worried that, um, about me coming out to Montana because he was supposed to come out to Montana in a couple of weeks so we could get to know each other a little bit better. Sure. And my mom is really worried about it. So I'm not going to come until like two days before the wedding. And Did he say thought, why? Um, because uh, of temptation. 
is going to be too much temptation. And that was the first time I spoke up and I said, if you don't come out in a week or two, we're not getting married. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, which I always wonder, like, one, like, why I had the strength to realize that that was Right. Like you're seeing some red flags. Yeah. I was seeing the red flags, but I wasn't responding. Like I should have responded more. Sure. Um, I think a lot of it was the adults in my life. They kind of just were like, Oh, I guess this is the right thing. And they just kind of stood back. Right. Um, including my parents. Like, I think they were like, I guess it's fine. You know? Um, so that was in February and we got married in April. So he did come out. He no, came did he come out, out about three or four weeks before? Okay. Um, and still though, like we had, there was like 17 people living in the house. Okay. So you, you, even if you wanted to be alone, you couldn't be. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, like I said, it was very, it was very dictated, very, um, you know, and I had seen a couple of other red flags that had happened. Um, sure. Dream even that couple of weeks that made me really wonder, like, I'm not sure if this is the right thing. Did you talk to anyone and, and say, I don't know? I was really scared. Mm-hmm. And I was scared because I felt like, well, women, you're not supposed to know. Like, maybe I'm not hearing right they're all on board with this. My dad seems fine with it. You know, Sergey, my brother-in-law, he seemed fine with it. Sure. Um, so I decided to fast and pray. And then I got very, very sick. Okay. Right. Cause um, you're not eating. I wasn't eating. And I think, um, my immune system was just really bad. Um, now I, I believe I got mono. Okay. Um, possibly combined, like it was like influenza and then it went into that. Um, so the day before my wedding, I had a fever of 104. Oh my. Um, and I had no voice and my aunt and uncle, they had come for the wedding and I, they were the first people that said, well, not the first, but they said, are you sure, you know, that you want to do this like you're really sick yeah exactly and, um and it seemed like nobody else really was asking that um right and I had no voice I couldn't even respond I remember just smiling wow like, there um I had three other people um that had contacted me um that knew me and just say you know, I don't feel that right about this. Like, what are you doing? Are you sure this is what you want to do? Um, my grandparents were one and then two other um, family friends. Sure. That had known me for a long time. Um, and I was always grateful that they at least were brave enough to do that because it's really hard if you yeah. see someone getting married that you're like, I don't think this is right to mm-hmm. go and tell them that right it's really hard um so did you read how was your what was your response then to them um my grandparents I kind of just you know said well I guess I'm doing it you know kind of thing and they um well we're gonna love you and support you no matter what kind of thing right um I remember my grandpa changed the subject my grandma liked to push and yeah. My grandma, my grandpa <laughs> was like, so how's your cow? <laughs> it's like, this is awkward. Yeah. Um, so, but the rest of like, um, the other family, they came to me in person and talked to us. Um, and I just didn't say anything. I let my dad talk. Um, and they told me, you know, like they love me and stuff, but they couldn't come to the wedding. Okay. And, um, he, the man in that family, he passed away about a month later. He was killed in a mill accident. Okay. So I don't know, like if he would have tried to do more after that. Right. 
as their family kind of was torn apart, like sure. traumatic death right after that. Um, and the other family was um, one that was kind of like my second parents and they lived far away and they called and um, they were like, what are you doing? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Um, and so I didn't really hear from them very much after that for a, quite a long time. Okay. And you told them at that point, what was your response when they asked you, you know, I kind of just laughed it off. I didn't really say much. Sure. Um, I was worried, you know, like you're thinking you're doing what's God's will. Mm -hmm. That was the big thing. So I felt like if I spoke against it, I'm speaking against God. Right. And I think that was one, that's one of the main facets of this whole belief system. Right. You're trying to please God and these man-made rules with, a uh, a doctrine of basically, um, you know, if you do everything right, if you submit to your dad, you submit to your, you know, family members, you know, like the right way you're going to have be blessed. Right. Prosperity gospel of this. Right. And, and, um, so, so what's the wedding like? So, you know, you're super sick the day before. Do I'm you make it sick. up I the aisle? A, I take um, <laughs> Tylenol or something, trying to get the inflammation down in my voice. Sure. And um, I remember I got dressed. We couldn't, I couldn't walk down like a traditional aisle because I was worried I'd pass out. Oh no. Yeah. Um, and then the man that did the ceremony, he was from Canada he spoke like four different languages and was very full of himself. Um, and um, he, so he preached this very long sermon and translated it himself into Russian. Um, okay. So like twice as long because we have yeah, to Yeah. Do... So it was like two hours. And you were just standing there the whole time. And I'm standing there. And at one point I remember um, hitting the wall because I was blacking out. Oh, like, no. And then someone brought me a chair. Okay. Um, because we were standing. And I think all of us, because my dad had been sick too, and my sister, and so we were all like fading. Yeah, um, exactly. So we weren't thinking so much about the wedding ceremony of getting <laughs> conscious. Um, <laughs> Just trying to literally make it through the day. Yeah. Um, the only thing I remember from the ceremony sermon was he said, so if your wife and your donkey fall into the river, you need to save your wife and not the donkey. Which, and okay. I remember thinking, isn't that assumed? Like, why yeah. is this a question? Exactly. Yeah, why, why is this like, you know, <laughs> being talked about? Um, but that was the only thing I remembered. Well, he was so into his sermon, he forgot to do wedding vows. Oh, sure. Yeah. So you just, and you got married without him? Like just. Yeah. So then they just had the parents, they had the parents come up and like lay hands on us and pray for us. And that was it. No, you know, kiss. But a first you know. kiss, right? No, we didn't. Do oh, no kissing. Okay. Yeah. So I was kind of like, okay that that this is weird you yeah know, but I don't feel very good so of course you're not speaking up very much right and of course I had been teaching myself you know not to speak up right um and it just kind of went downhill from there <laughs> so the honeymoon was not good no it was not good and um he had very um, twisted ideas of what marriage should look like um, and likely from porn use or sure. the like. And so it was here, I'm somebody who's very sheltered, very, you know, so I end up going to like a bookstore and I'm looking at trying to find marriage books to figure out like what on earth am I supposed to be doing? Because right. I'm too embarrassed to ask someone because I think I should know this, right? Right. Everyone should know how to do sex and have know these things. And I knew all the mechanics, 
right I wasn't sheltered in that way but it was more I didn't understand what I guess what perversion and that kind of stuff was like okay I was not there um he wasn't you know and his brother so he's like trying to be counselor I guess oh the brother sure yeah but I think we've been married only a couple months and we were going to get paint at the hardware store and um walking to the hardware store and I walked in front of him oh okay and um I heard I think probably 30 minute 40 minute lecture on why you should never walk in front of your husband and why was that it was very disrespectful it was disrespecting his authority and his you know place in the house and you're like showing that you're in charge not him and so um you needed to make sure that you were always thinking and aware of where you were what you were doing how you were talking um and that's why i was saying it kind of it starts with like the stay-at-home daughter thing and then right. it went into that um sort of thing and it just got worse from there mm-hmm. um, um we ended up moving to minnesota and the church there kind of built on that and got worse okay. and worse as it went along okay um, when we finally when i left um uh fred had decided that he wanted to move back to montana because he didn't like they were telling him what to do a lot and um sure like that and um it wasn't probably for the right reasons but it did get us out of there okay Um, and we came back to montana and um i joined some online groups um email groups Mm -hmm. and um one of them was called the patriarch's wives okay it was very like they were proud of being yes okay and um it was very uh um involved with like vision forum oh right and uh doug phillips and um you know they're friends with them like rc sprawl jr and you know a lot of these big names but sure um those were people that they knew and um so i think it actually helped me go to start questioning things because i'm reading what they're writing and i start asking questions like right. well, what about this and i've experienced this what how is this right and um you know we had some good discussion so were the people in, were there people in the group you know the email group that were telling you no, that's not right. Like that doesn't seem right. Were you getting any? Most of it was not. And they were really intense on the stay at home daughter. Like their girls, they were going to stay home. They, you know, they wanted these amazing courtships. And I'm saying, you know, it doesn't always go well. Sure. Like I start telling them stories about like, well, my friends, they did this, they did everything right. And this is happening to them. And what is their response back? Well, that's rare. Okay. Was generally the response. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I started and um, Fred started, was having a lot of um, mental health issues. Sure. And so I'm thinking I have to try to figure out like how to make money. I got to do different things. And here now, because I didn't go and get any more education, I'm kind of stuck. So at this point, you're still, okay, you're still with him, but he's, he's not able to provide. He's not working very well. Yeah. So I have, I would think I was, when we came back to Montana, I was pregnant with my third son. Okay. Um, and so I went before, um, before I had Tony, I joined the, I got trained as an EMT. Okay. Um, and, and your I, husband's supportive of this or he didn't really care. He didn't sure. really, um, he was kind of out of it, like didn't really 
pay much attention to any of us. Right. Um, unless, uh, you know, he, it was just his mental health stuff. And he just, as long as the only thing he really liked to be very blunt, he only cared about sex. So that mm -hmm. was pretty much the only thing he cared about. You know, right. As long as I took care of the kids and whatever, he was fine. And right. at that, we had really cheap rent. Um, and so we made it work. Um, but his, his mental health was going downhill um, a lot. Um, I went, when I decided to go, I decided to go to move to Kalispell. He had, um, he was in Minnesota. They were trying to help. They figured if they prayed enough that he'd get better. Okay. So, so mental health treatment. Yeah. Is wasn't not really an option. Right. Um, and so they had taken him back to Minnesota and then up to Alaska and they were hoping, you know, if they prayed for him, you know, he'd be delivered. And, right. Um, uh, his family, because I was American, he was Russian. They figured it was probably my fault because he had never had issues in their minds until we got married. Okay. So how long is this time frame that he's away, you know, trying to get healed and you're in Montana? So, um, we went back and forth a little bit, but it was, he was gone, I think for a good, um, when he had his major, his last major breakdown, I found out I was pregnant with Tony in October, in November. He had it December. He was gone until April. Oh, wow. So a good stretch of time. Yeah. And so, um, I moved to Kalispell during that time because there was a Russian church down here and I thought, oh, well, when he comes back, he'll have good support, be better. Um, and he continued to go downhill until June. Um, I ended up, I took him to the emergency room and we had a, um, a hold against his will. We had to go to court and um, have a mental health evaluation. And he went to Warm Springs then. Okay. And, and he was so, gone for? Um, from June until November. Okay. Yeah. And then when he comes back. Yeah. So he that? came back, in, he came back in November and um, I didn't know if he was ever coming back. I mean, he. Sure. He was pretty upset, you know, when he left, of course. And, um, and so I'm facing the church that I was involved with. They, um, told me that it was my fault because I didn't move to Alaska when they had told me to, um, and this is a church here in Kalispell. No, it was the one that I had been a part of in Minnesota. Okay. Um, right. And so but I didn't feel peaceful about that. I'm like, they haven't helped us in this whole time period. They've always kind of, you know, so I'm having all these questions. Right. So it basically though, you take all these beliefs of, well, if you do everything right, you don't date. Right. Listen to your parents. You're going to have a perfect marriage with yeah. less children and everything will go right. And nothing is going right like that. Right. So I'm like, my husband's in a mental hospital. I just had my fourth son. No one wants to hire me now because not only do I not have anything more than a high school education, I have no work experience at all. Right. Right. Um, the jobs that I can get are minimum wage. I can't pay rent and pay and childcare for four children under six. Yeah. Um, you know, if I can get someone to hire me with all those children, exactly. People look at you and go, eh, yeah. you're a risk. Um, so I started doing, um, and I would ask the people like on my group, my email group, okay, what do I do? Well, maybe in your case, it's okay to get a job, but you should really try to like do something from home. So even at this point, they're questioning your yeah. decision to, to get a to job. Work. Yeah. Right. And I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to pay the rent next month. 
Yeah. Like, what am I supposed to do? Well, have you asked the church? Well, I don't, my church is, they, I'm between churches. So I start visiting all the churches in Kalispell. Yeah. Um, and they're kind of looking at you like, hmm, what you're here with all these little kids. Right. Where's your husband? You know, Did they ask you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, one church, um, I went to one that was more conservative and they kind of basically told me they didn't think it was the right church for me because he wasn't around because you really wow. needed the husband to be involved and, um, that I should look for other friends. Wow. Cause I didn't really fit their model. Okay. Um, and so that was hard. Um, and I, when I started going, uh, to harvest where sure. my family, yep. um, they, uh, it was because I had gotten a postcard in the mail. Cause I think, cause I had done mops at East Haven okay. and they were doing a kids program right at the Stillwater. And so, um, when they were starting and so it started on the morning that Tony was born. Okay. So Tony was born at like eight thirty or eight fifteen, and it started at eight thirty. So, my, so you I, drove them all over there? No. So my <laughs> friend, like, I have the baby. He brings Paul in and says, "Here, look at your new brother," and then took him out the door to this kids program. Yeah. And um, and she gets there and she says, "Oh, they say where's his mom? Oh, she can't come. She just had a baby. Oh, when did she have the baby? Oh, like twenty minutes ago." Oh, they're probably she, like, what? <laughs> she just had a baby. <laughs> and, um, I think it was Brenda Buckner. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, and so she she was a little shocked, you know, like, oh, wow, that's funny. Sure. Um, so I did. I started going there, but I was, had so many questions, like, you know, about my faith at that point. I'm am I doing things wrong? Am I doing things right? All these things that I've been taught, everybody's right. telling me you did everything right, but nothing's happening like they said it would. So what else did they tell me wrong? Exactly. You know? Yeah. So, so at this point you're still, um, now your husband has gotten, so he's not with you at this point. No, he okay. wasn't there until, until later when we got in November when he came back, he was in and out, like they had him in a safe house and then he would come sure. home. Um, and so I, um, and I was dealing with other things in my life, like the landlord wasn't happy that I had all those kids in the apartment. Right. And so she really encouraged us to move, um, basically harassing me. Right. I would move. Um, she's the one that made me go into property management. Um, oh, I sure. Figured I could do better. <laughs> <laughs> you could be a nicer landlord. <laughs> um, she, yeah, she's definitely a, a interesting person. Um, but you know, you have those the experiences. Um, but in the middle of it, I had little like messages from God that kind of made me realize, okay, it's, man has created all these ideals, like these perfect things, but this is not actually what God says and what the Bible says. So mm -hmm. it started bringing me back to like looking at it. You okay. Know, what do those verses actually say? Right. Um, and it was a long period of time. Um, but I had, um, my, uh, I was able to buy a mobile home mm -hmm. without an income, right? Without any money, and I—it was a miracle, you know, that I was able to do that. Um, but God really, you know, um, was able to to bring that about, and it did. It helped increase my faith. Sure, you know, in those little things that He was providing for me. Right. Um, I had money that would appear in my mailbox that I don't know, still don't know where it came from. Mm -hmm. You know, people, strangers that mailed me money. Right. Um, and I'm like, I don't understand this, you know, but I, it was kind of like that 
widow's might of, you know, I had just had faith and I had to have faith and pray. Right. That he was going to provide for me because I was willing to work, um, but it, it wasn't happening. I did. I worked for um, a magazine. Um, I did advertising and marketing and I did, yeah. um, I worked for doing Whirlpool um, demonstrations at Costco. Oh, on the cool. Website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was at that point, it was $15 uh, dollars an hour. Yeah. That's pretty um, good for, I mean, that time. Yeah. That era, time yeah. period. And so, um, and Fred had come home. And so it was really hard though, because I didn't have childcare. Yeah. And he couldn't really watch them. So it was more Paul watching them. Yeah. Which he was not, he was like six, seven. Okay. So you're leaving um, him home with your husband, but he's not. Yeah. Really... And he's like falling asleep and yeah, not like it's, he wasn't watching them. So, but they would bring the baby to me to nurse. Okay. And I'd go out and. At Costco? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, um, I don't know if you remember the old Costco. So yes. Uh, the doorway where the doorway came out, they had put the whirlpool people right there. Okay. So as everyone's coming out with their receipts, right? You're standing there in the middle. Yep. And getting run over. Sure. And so I'm like, and you're just nursing a baby right there. Yeah, I'm like yeah. ready to, you know. Okay, I'm I'm just doing this. You know, I had <laughs> to wear blue and tan, and so I the only tan skirt I had was like this size twelve. Yeah. Skirt. So I like, I had no money. <laughs> so I like, you know, took, um, you know, took it in and, um, you know, it did not look great. <laughs> <laughs> but I was desperate to make money. But I remember, I think I felt so guilty. For working? Like I'm, yeah, I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, you feel bad because you have to pay your bills. Exactly. You know, and so it created this dynamic in your brain of I'm sinning when there's not really a sin. Sure. You know, and saying, okay, God, if this is sin and this is sin, which is the less sin? Right. I'm going to pick that one. And, you know, and it trailed down to like birth control was mm -hmm. another one of, okay, if I have more children, I can't support them. Right. But if I keep, if I don't have more children, I'm going to go to hell. So which is worse because both of them say that you're bad if you don't. Do. Yeah. Um, so a lot of like, yeah, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. And so just saying, okay, um, you know, God, what can I do? Mm -hmm. Um, no. So at what point does that mentality start shifting where you're like, okay, I feel okay I about providing for point, my family. At that point, it started to shift. Mm -hmm. um, some, it, it took a little while, like to get to that point. It was a gradual thing. Sure. Um, but that was definitely a major part of it when I'm having to work because otherwise we're not going to have food. We're not going to have clothes. Right. I'm selling everything that is anything of value in the house. I'm, you know, and then um, Fred did start to work after he had gotten back after about a year. I think he, he had, he had um, started to work and got um, disability. So that okay. did ease, ease some of it. Um, right. But I was still working part time sure. to pay sure. for any like extra school stuff and that kind of stuff. Right. So that kind of propelled you forward to be able yeah. to pursue other you know, right. business ventures and things. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's, let's kind of fast forward, you know, to today. So did you eventually, you know, leave the marriage or what made you make that decision if you did? Yeah. So, um, we ended up getting divorced about, it's been a little over three years ago. Um, but it, it took a while just to come to that conclusion because, you know, you don't get divorced when you're right. Just like I do, I was. And so, um, I had to really like balance, you know, okay, again, 
it's starting to be a safety issue here. Mm -hmm. Um, What can I do, you know, as far as, as far as that. And so, um, dealing with the thoughts of, okay, I'm going to lose all my friends, everybody that has supported me possibly may hate me for this because, or you're also relegated to a life of being alone for the rest of your life, possibly, you know, depending on your belief, you know, right. A lot of the beliefs that I heard were, were that way too. Mm -hmm. So it was, um, you know, it's a lot of stuff to wrap around in your head. And he's telling me, I want a divorce. I want a divorce. And he'd been doing that for many years. Okay. Um, and it, the abuse had just gotten to a point where I didn't want to live anymore. Yeah. And I was again, facing those choices of, okay, which is worse. (laughs) You know, you're staying married for the sake of staying married versus I'm going to, um, I want to die. Right. And, um, so I went, I started seeking help, um, for that and learning what the Bible says about oppression and kind of looking at the Bible for the very first time through different eyes of, wow, I never really saw God actually says this and he doesn't say women are lower than men to like, as far as value. Sure. Um, which was very, a very, I think it played a huge role in the whole marriage scenario, um, all the way down to when I just wanted to be done. And so when he left, um, I still had a hard time wrapping my head around it. Right. Okay. Now I'm working full time. Yeah. Um, You know, I'm doing jobs that, and I constantly, even not in those conservative circles, you hear comments like, well, why are you doing this? You know, where's your guy, you know, kind of thing. Sure. Why are you talking to the contractor? Um, Why are you telling us what to do? Yeah. Um, Still that. Yeah. For sure. You know, you look too young, you look, you know, um, you know, so, and I think those voices in your head that you're raised with, the, you should be under someone's authority. And especially for me, because not only, you know, with not having a husband, but my dad is, he's not a good person and he's gone. He's out of my life. Right. So I don't even have that. Yeah. It's not like you can go. And I remember asking someone that was in there, I was like, if you don't have a husband, you don't have a dad, then what are you supposed to do? Right. And what was her Who's response? That, you know, am I under, and I'm like, aren't I under God's umbrella? Right. You know, well, you should probably find a man in the church that you can, you know, you sure. know, be underneath. So that kind of, um, I feel like it's idolized to right. a point where we we've created this own doctrine that sends it, it just trickles down into every aspect of the life of these people afterwards. And right. there's some amazing people who have done this and have them wonderful marriages, you know, great families. Right. Um, but one one of them, I remember her telling me like. I didn't realize I could ask my husband and tell, ask him questions about a decision he made. And I'm wow. really upset about this decision he made. He had no idea. And then he's upset later when he finds right. out because I didn't express it. And it caused problems in their marriage because she wasn't, she didn't feel like she could ask him, well, why are, why are we eating dinner at four o'clock? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and she's resentful of it. And he's like, well, I thought you wanted to. Right. So the communication is yeah. breaking down. And, and a lot. so that's what I'm saying. Like, even in the good marriages, it causes problems. Because right. Because you've been taught, you don't ask questions, you don't speak up. They're, they're your authority in everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Okay. So a couple other questions, and then we'll probably wrap up. Um, 
What would you say to someone either that's in the movement or, you know, thinking, man, some of these ideas sound really good. Like I can protect my daughters. They won't have to live in danger or I can help them find a spouse or, you know, whatever. What would you say to someone who is considering that? I would say that, um, when you start living by man's rules rather than God's rules, you always end up with problems, um, that it can sound really good on the surface. Um, Mm -hmm. but in the end, um, that's not how God created us. He created us to be male and female and yes, to have our own roles. Um, but when we start suppressing or oppressing like one person over another, that, and in, even in trying to protect, I've seen people who are not even conservative trying to protect and know where their children are at all times. Right. Um, it just causes, it causes a breakdown in the whole structure of a family and impacts your, not only those children, but your grandchildren and family relationships. And I would say, eh, you know, just be really careful. Like most of the time, I'm not going to go and scare you with a bunch of things, but sure. Um, we, uh, I helped a young man that he wrote a book called, well, he wrote a blog post first about why courtship is fundamentally flawed. Okay. And then he wrote, um, he wrote a book that I helped him with too. And he kind of goes into more of the science of it, mm-hmm. of why, why this breaks down for the future. And, um, and that I might recommend something like that if I thought they were open sure. to reading, um, you know, like here's people who have tried it. They've actually tried this with all their hearts and why it, it, it doesn't work. And so it just kind of depends on the person, um, right. is what I would say to them, but generally if they're pretty gung ho and really happy, I'm going to smile and say, when you're ready to talk about it. <laughs> exactly. <here>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add that I didn't touch on? I think you covered most of it. Um, do you see anything else that you want to hear about? Or no? I mean, I could talk to you all day because I'm yeah. so intrigued. <laughs> So, um, but it's so yeah. fascinating to hear your story. Thank you so much for sharing it. I know it's